Welcome, everybody. I'd like to ask you to take a seat so we can begin the program. I'm here, grew up on the shores of America. Open up shop, brand stores in America. Wash windows, clean floors in America. Only trust me with your chores in America. Just need one open door in America. Cry when we elected 44 for America. My family's here, fought wars for America. On TV, just a whore for America. I get the memo, this is your America. Let's take my money, tax forms in America. Take a food, charge more in America. Use a culture for decor in America. History that you can't ignore. America. America, I'm the leader I was looking for. America, never silent, keeping score. America, and it's time I needed more. We're still here. We're going strong. Change since Vincent Chin, the difference just names. Shout to Dao, y'all soon ja, know these names. Hyun Jung, Soon Jung, Young, eh, we have names. Victims, silence, evicted from our lives. Cause our skin is the color they love to villainize. What if it's food, movies, or women they love to fetishize? What if it's COVID 19? Then oh, China virus. Fuck these colonizers, calling us outsiders. We built this country too, and they built it alongside us. One generation, two generation, three to the young generation, you generate me. So T, Tayo, and one, and Chucky, and anyone who feels like a guest. In their country, and everyone has ever lost a body to the struggle. No, you're not alone. I promise all of my people, y'all, we love you when we keep. Magnitude and bond, black feminist scholarship, indigenous songs belong at the center like ethnic studies. Be the Robin Hood and invest in us. We be living pleasure acts abundantly. Abolition is healing our suffering. Belong in our purpose to the ones in need. Cause if one ain't got it, ain't no one free. I speak from the streets of Lanape Ho King. All my relations need reparations. Power to the people, our disposition. Belong to the land with First Nations permission. Maktub, the word that was written when we decolonized. We belong to wisdom, the cry for liberty, the right side of history. Overstand the bigotry, it's never really finished. Still here, even when it's no we going strong. song that actually comes from the 70s. Chris Ijima originally wrote it and it's been updated and uh, made to fit our modern times and music with some guest uh, uh, musicians. And, uh, but unfortunately, it's still very relevant today. My name is Robin Toma. I'm Executive Director of the County's Human Relations Commission. I want to welcome all of you to today's event, which is the place to be if you are against hate today. Um, this is one of several events commemorating the 40th anniversary of the murder of Vincent Chin happening around the country. And uh, I am with the, uh, as I mentioned, the County Government's Human Relations Commission, and I'm organizer, we're an organizer of today's event with the Chinese American Museum. And I have the honor of serving as MC for today's event. My pronouns are he and him. And I want to begin by acknowledging that this event is taking place on the historic village site of Yang, Yangna, 
which is the, in the Tovangar unceded traditional territories of the Gabrielino, Shoshone, Kiz, and Tongva indigenous peoples of these lands. And to this day, there are several of those tribes that still maintain an ongoing presence, power, and relations among their peoples and the lands that they belong to. So I invite you to remember the indigenous peoples who affirm their sovereignty and, the, um, and ask yourselves, how do you, your people, and your organization honor these relatives? So, um, now when the County Human Relations Commission talked about doing this event, we recognized that our commission as the headquarters, so to speak, of this countywide program, LA versus Hate, um, our rapid response network, we had an opportunity to honor the, the memory of Vincent Chin, who was murdered on the night before his wedding. And despite the killers admitting guilt, his mother Lily saw a painful lack of justice by the system. And so obvious was this injustice that it sparked activism by Asian American allies around the country and was a pivotal point in the history of Asians in the United States. But not only did we, as the commission, feel the need to commemorate Vincent Chin for his mother and the Asian American communities, unfortunately, this is extremely relevant to this moment with the tremendous suffering that we're seeing um, not only of the horrific anti-Asian hate violence that's been unleashed during the pandemic, but most recently, the continuing unspeakable racial violence that took the lives of 11 people targeted because they were black in Buffalo, New York, and also uh, Taiwanese uh, in Laguna Woods in neighboring Orange County. And as recently as just a few nights ago, there was an ugly act of what appears to be hate violence very close to our offices here in Koreatown. Uh, and so, unfortunately, this is extraordinarily current to the situation we're experiencing today. Not just history, but something that we are still living through and still struggling with. I want to mention that today we have with us our Commission President, Guadalupe Montaño. Um, we also have Commissioners Isabel Gunning, Frederick Sykes, Helen Chin, Jeanette Ellis Royston, and Gay Ewan. Let me ask you to give them applause for their service and leadership. <laughs> our commission's been tracking hate crimes for 40 years and convening our LA County Network Against Hate Crime for almost as long. Um, and our lead in that work is Marshall Wong, who's here with us today. Marshall, want to raise your hand? Um, but you know, I want to point out that uh, despite our work on reporting for many years, it's still a grave problem. We had um, such a low number of hate crimes reported against Asians in our last full calendar year that we got reports of. And we know that the 40-some hate crimes that were reported are clearly an un a number that is not reflective of the reality. But what we do know is that um, our statistics can help to confirm or overturn perceptions. Many of you have seen many of the reports that would give the impression that the suspects of anti-Asian hate crime are mainly African American. And I want to tell you that when we looked at the statistics, in fact, it showed that uh, the most of the suspects who committed hate crimes against Asian Americans in our last annual report were mostly white, and also they were black and Latino. But certainly not the impression that one would be led to believe by some of the media coverage and social media. I want to tell you that one of the ways that we're fighting hate is through LA versus hate. And we have so far 1,860 calls to our 211 hate reporting line since we began it in September 2001. So today we want to bring you here to strengthen our unity across lines of race, religion, nationality, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, gender identity, and be clear that we must energize our communities. We must be leaders in every way, in whatever place that we lead. Today we have inspiring speakers like Stuart Quo, uh, many other leaders, along with excerpts from powerful award-winning documentaries and cultural performances, ending with a candlelight vigil to collectively pledge action to fight hate. 
And now I have the pleasure of introducing the one who had the idea, the vision for this event, Dr. Gay Ewan. She's a retired education professor from Cal State LA and currently chair of the Chinese American Museum. And from my perspective, most importantly, a, a county human relations commissioner. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Gay Ewan to the stage. Thank you so much, Robin, and welcome to everyone who took the time to come here today to join us in this commemoration of a significant event 40 years ago that happened to the Asian Pacific American community, but also it connects, as Robin said, to the fights that we are fighting today. Not only the hate that's been put upon the Asian Pacific American community, but throughout the history of the United States with the hate that disenfranchised groups have to fight, basically due to our color, due to our language, due to our social status, due to our economic situation, due to who we choose to love or how we look, and those are the hate that are continuing. So as we remember Vincent Chin 40 years ago and the horrible murder that happened in Detroit, we also need to look at what's happening now. It was only about four months ago when I started receiving uh, notices from across the country talking about how different uh, cities, organizations throughout the United States will be commemorating the murder of Vincent Chin. And as I waited in Southern California, we didn't see any uh, events that are being publicized or that will be happening. So I met with our executive director, Michael Trong, and we talked about what we need to do to not forget what happened 40 years ago and also to talk about today. And as we were talking, we thought, what better way than to look for community partners who have the same social values, uh, the values of so social justice, the values of inclusion, the values of diversity, and see if we can pull something together for this commemoration. And as a member of the Human Rights Commission for the county, um, we asked my fellow commissioners if they would vote to put on this event for us as a, a partner of the Chinese American Museum. And I had tears in my eyes, but none of you saw it commissioners because we were on Zoom. <laughs> so I had tears in my eyes when it was a unanimous vote for the Human Relations Commission to take on the, the putting on of this event. So I really like to thank my fellow commissioners. In the audience are also, yes, please, clap, clap, clap. Thank you, my fellow commissioners, and thank you, Robin, for the lead that you've been taking throughout this three months of planning. Then there's also my board of directors from CAM. And for those of you who have never been to the Chinese American Museum, we're right there. And so <laughs> if you've never been, you can try to visit us tonight. And if not, you can contact us and come back and visit anytime. Kay. We are charged with the mission of telling the stories of the Chinese who came to the United States. And so those stories, some of the, the events have happened right at our doorsteps. Last October 24th, we commemorated the 150th anniversary of the massacre, of the Chinese massacre. And the Chinese massacre happened right on our doorsteps. And it took 150 years, but Mayor Garcetti announced that he would commemorate 
that event and the 18 people who were killed in 1871 by erecting a monument to remember the victims. And again, what was very moving for us was that he apologized on behalf of the city. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he said, I'm sorry 14 times. I count it. <laughs> and he said, I'm sorry 14 times. And by the 14th time, we believed him. So I want to introduce some of the Chinese American Museum's board members who are here with us today. We have Mr. Al Suhu. We have Bruce Lazenby. We have Dorothy Tamashiro, Julie Foon, Jenny Lin, and Ed Liu. And there might be others out there. And I don't want, Robin gave me three minutes, so I think I'm over my three minutes already. But I want to say something very personal. Because in preparation for this event, um, I, I viewed many of the, um, of the videos and, and, uh, and read many of the books that describe this incident. And what struck me was Mrs. Chen, an elder Chinese woman who came as an immigrant, learned some English, and devoted her whole life to this one adopted son that she and her husband brought over from China. And what's gut-wrenching to me, because I can relate to it, I'm a somewhat elderly Chinese-American woman, and I have a son, an adult son. And for her, in the video, which you will be seeing snippets of later, for Mrs. Chin, in her limited English, to keep saying, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. Already was so tragic to see a mother mourning her son. But I heard her Chinese in those segments where she spoke in her Taishan dialect in Chinese. And she said, Ki ho koi ya. How did this happen? How, this ha how did this happen? And she also said, Yum gong lo, yum gong lo. And it's, it's so tragic. It's so tragic. And those are the words and the tears of a mother mourning her son. And the death of Vincent was the death of all her hope that she and her husband fought for. And so while we can never forget, the next step to never forgetting is that we have to say something and do something. And with Robin, with the Human Relations Commission, with Hilda Solis, who appointed me to the commission and being one of the first to come out publicly to speak out against anti-Asian hate. I think that we need to remember, but we also need to use our voices and to use our action so that this can't continue to happen again. We have speakers coming up. Some are what I call legacy speakers who, who was around during the time of the eruption of the protests and the organization of Asian Americans. There are visionaries and storytellers, whether they wrote books or made documentaries or made films that will help us to never forget. And now there are really young, articulate, dedicated young warriors who we are now depending on to help guide the future so that these things don't happen again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuen. 
Um, I wanted to also just welcome those who are uh, joining us on our live stream on the Facebook page, LAVersus8.org. And I was reminded I should look at the camera to uh, show that they're included in this. Um, so I want to welcome them as well. Um, now I wanted to uh, let you know that we're going to show a little bit of a video of um, uh, from the movie Vincent Who, uh, which is made possible by the uh, courtesy of the executive producer Curtis Chin, who we're actually uh, privileged to have with us here today. Curtis, stand, take, stand up and take a bow. You'll, you'll feel it more once you, if you haven't seen the movie, you'll certainly feel it even more. Um, you can watch that video at his website for free at curtisfromdetroit.com. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know that um, I think it's a, an, a very powerful way of uh, taking you back to, to the time uh, and what it meant for, uh, for this country. So with that, why don't we go ahead and start the clip. That affected all of us. It's hard to even imagine, I think, for people today what it was like then. The ethnic populations, whether Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Korean, Indian, Vietnamese, they were really so tiny. So the idea of people coming together to stand up, to build a movement together, to say that we stand against racism and against violence and hate crimes against Asian Americans had never been done before. Before the Vincent Chin case, it's fair to say there weren't Asian Americans. There were Chinese Americans, there were Japanese Americans. There had been briefly in the 1960s a student movement on the West Coast. When college students and activists came together and we called ourselves Asian American. But there wasn't a meaningful abiding Asian American movement. It faltered. It didn't have an icon, a symbol. It didn't have a narrative that people could identify with. The thing that was really amazing about the case is that people from diverse backgrounds, people who have never been to a protest rally in their entire lives, all of a sudden have this sudden outburst of energy and commitment to see that justice is done. For the waiters and the restaurant workers and the chefs and the laundry workers and the engineers and the scientists, um, in the 1980, up until the 1980s, for them to come together and say, we are standing up as Asian Americans, that had never happened before. The one thing that has pulled together through sheer concern all Asian Americans in this country and brought press and so forth from overseas and, and concern from overseas is the belief that Vincent Chin would be alive today if he were not Asian. And there is no question about that in any of our minds. Do you think this trial would have occurred had not your group and, and other Asian Americans gotten involved and brought pressure to bear here and around the country? I don't think any civil rights trial occurs unless there's pressure. The Vincent Chin murder just galvanized and motivated a lot of people to speak out even more than they were doing. Helen was an activist before that, but I think she became more involved in the Asian American community after that with the contacts that she made across the country. And uh, I think Stuart Quo, who was always involved in Asian American issues since the start of the Asian American movement, came forward and stepped up and uh, was able to help uh, provide leadership. We need our own stories of people. We don't have a lot of Jesse Jacksons in our community, uh, but we do have a number of Lily Chins. When Mrs. Chin came to Los Angeles, she was talking at a very crowded Chinatown restaurant, and at one point she collapsed, and I helped her to her feet, and that night she was staying at our home, and I asked her, Lily, are, are you okay? And she said, Stuart, there's nothing I can do to bring back Vincent, but I don't want any other mother to go through what I've gone through. I will never forget. That's when, when I saw Vincent Cheng's mother is standing in front of protester and the news media from all over. She made a statement and I knew how she felt. She stood in front of many people and I quote, I am here for justice for my son, unquote. As a mother, I knew exactly how she felt. 
Unfortunately, while we were filming, every time she saw a camera, as we might. So now I have the privilege of introducing keynote speaker, President Emeritus, uh, past president, past executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, um, Stuart Kuo. Um, yes, go ahead, he deserves it. Absolute hero of our community, a legend in his own time. Um, let me say that um, a little bit about him that you may not know, he's an avid fisherman, but also a nationally recognized leader and expert in race relations. You don't often see those two come together. Asian American, uh, uh, expert in Asian American studies, and um, in 1998 was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, becoming the first Asian American attorney and human rights activist to receive this highly prestigious recognition, often referred to as the Genius Grant. And that's very fitting because he certainly has been a genius for social justice. With that, uh, please join me again in welcoming Stuart Quo. Thank you very much, Robin. And uh, I want to uh, thank uh, the Chinese American Museum and Gay Yuan. Uh, let's thank her again. And Michael Trung. And uh, thank you to the LA County Human Relations Commission. I don't, I'm not biased at all. Uh, the county had uh, honored me many decades ago, but I, I was president of the LA City Human Relations Commission um, in 1989. Uh, I also want to um, say that I have uh, 40 years of experience with the Vincent Chin case. And all along that, period of time, I was uh, partnered with my, uh, my dear partner, Pat, uh, Pat Lee, who's sitting right here, uh, who helped guide me. And by the way, this is uh, Pat's birthday today. Um, I just want to speak briefly. Uh, Vincent Chin and the case of Vincent Chin is important to me. Uh, for three reasons. Number one, I got a chance to meet Lily Chen, whose picture you see right here. I want to repeat that story that um, the, uh, uh, the excellent documentary uh, mentioned. Uh, just about three blocks from here, uh, we held a meeting in uh, 1984 uh, because uh, we invited Lily to Los Angeles to ask for help to get justice for her son. At that time, um, I had gone, in 1983, I had gone to Detroit, and the activists there asked me to help them out. And I suggested we try to get the Department of Justice, even though it was under a conservative president, Reagan, uh, to file a hate crimes, federal hate crimes case against the killers who got home on probation and a $3,000 fine for killing Vincent. Uh, we could only imagine if the killers had been Asian or black or Latinx. Uh, we could only imagine. Uh, but they got th uh, home on probation and a $3,000 fine. So we launched this campaign uh, to get the Department of Justice to bring the case, and they eventually did in 1985. Uh, but before then, we asked Lily to come to Los Angeles, and I was the mod moderator at that time. And she was asking, as Gay said, for help to get justice for her son, who didn't get justice in the state court and she fainted. And that night, she was uh, staying at Pat in my home. Uh, at, that one, at that time, we had one son, now we have two. A uh, very loving woman. And I said, Lily, are you okay? And she said, Stuart, there's nothing I can do to bring back Vincent. He's gone. But I don't want any other mother to go through what I've gone through. And in Lily's spirit, let me say, she would say today, she doesn't want any other mother, including mothers in Uvalde, Texas, 
to go through what she's gone through. She would say she doesn't want any mother or any other grandmother to go through what the victims and their families have gone through in Buffalo, New York. When Lily said she didn't want any other mother to go through what she's gone through, she didn't say she doesn't want any other Chinese mother to go through what she's gone through, any other Asian mother to go through, through what she's gone through. She didn't want any other mother to go through what she went through. That's why I became the only out-of-state co-counsel to Lily's organization, the, uh, Asian, the American Citizens for Justice. And I was proud to help push it, so we got the Justice Department to bring the federal prosecution. Unfortunately, there was an appeal after the first uh, federal trial, and then it ended up in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, where the all-white jury didn't understand the racial motivation and acquitted both killers who did not spend one day of their lives for, for killing Vincent Chin. But my hero was Lily Chin, who um, unfortunately felt after the second federal trial that the United States was not a place where she could get justice, and she moved back to China with her remaining relatives. Uh, Pat and I and our boys went to visit her in 1995, and she was smiling, but in looking at her eyes, we realized she had lost everything in the United States. Her husband, six months before Vincent was killed, and then Vincent, and not getting justice for Vincent, who was never married because of that horrible incident. So Lily was our hero, not just for the Vincent Chin case, but for the United States of America. The second reason that this case was important to me is that it inspired a whole generation because none of us can rest easily when justice is not done. We have to stand up. We have to speak out. We have to get involved. And that's what uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of Asian Americans did after this horrible case. They devoted themselves to public service. They devoted themselves to civil rights movement activities. They devoted themselves to making sure that as a society, we reduce the number of mothers who go through what Lily's, uh, Lily Chin went through. And let me say the third reason why this case is important to me. How many, how many of us will remember this case? Maybe a hundred of us here tonight. Maybe a few thousand who read the newspapers or view the videos. But uh, Pat and I have started the Asian American Education Project. I've been succeeded by wonderful President Connie Chung Jo, who will speak in a moment uh, at the uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. But after that, we started the Asian American Education Project to bring Vincent's story, to bring Asian American history into the schools of the United States of America. Do you agree? Uh, just last weekend, Two weekends ago, we uh, trained about 150 teachers in New York City. Uh, in Los Angeles, we just got approved a semester-long course on Asian American and Pacific Islander history, and it was approved by the state of California two weeks ago. Our goal is over the next five years is to bring these stories, including the Vincent Chin story, including Lily's story, to one million American youth. Not Asian American youth, but white youth, black youth, Latinx youth, Native American youth, all around the United States of America. So I ask you for help, because we need to get this into the schools. 
uh, because the schools are where it starts. The stereotypes, the falsehoods, that's where it starts. Just um, two blocks from here, there's a school that we were working with, uh, Pat and I, last year. And one non-Asian student wasn't coming to school. So the administration called her and said, why aren't you coming to school? She said her relatives told her to stay away from Asian American teachers and Asian American students. Why? Because they're spreading the coronavirus. Let's get rid of these falsehoods. Let's get rid of these stereotypes. Let's bring education to as many youth as we can throughout the United States of America. We pledge to work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. You know, it's, he's, uh, he's amazing. I remember I had the privilege to work at the Asian Pacific American Legal Center, the forerunner of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, when I was a law student many years ago, when it was just a handful of people at 1010 South Flower Street. And uh, so I can attest to the fact that Stuart has been on this road of justice his entire life and has been a, a true mentor and uh, teacher and an inspiring leader to me. So thank you, not just on behalf of all of us at the commission and all of us here, but for me personally, Stuart. I want to now um, turn to our next speaker, Connie Chung Jo, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles, the nation's largest legal and civil rights organization for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Let me just say thank you, yes. I want to tell you that prior to joining Advancing Justice, um, in August of 2020, she served as the executive director for the Korean American Family Services uh, Agency for 11 years. Um, prior to that, Connie was a public interest lawyer at the Housing Rights Center in Los Angeles and the American Civil Liberties Union in Chicago. And also, I was really fortunate to have her as my intern when she was a USC <laughs> student. So all these wonderful connections keep on happening, but she certainly is uh, someone to look to for leadership right now and uh, in our future against the kind of hate we're seeing, not only against Asian Americans, but against all communities. So with that, let's welcome Connie Chung Jo. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, as Robin mentioned, two days ago, an Asian American man was physically attacked out of the blue in Koreatown and was rendered in unconscious. And this happened almost 40 years to the day since Vincent Chin was beaten to death. And it's sobering to think how violence against our Asian American community continues on four decades later. Growing up, I never learned about Vincent Chin. My mom had mentioned it once to me and I couldn't really get it. What was the connection between the Japanese car industry and this Chinese American man? And it really wasn't until I became an adult and as a civil rights attorney, where I started learning about the greater context of the forever foreigner myth, the history of things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Japanese American concentration camps during World War II, that I started to understand that Vincent Chin's murder was more than just a personal tragedy, although it was that, as spoken so eloquently by Stewart and Gay but really it represented our Asian American community's tragedy. Now, to understand the rise in anti-Asian hate that we've seen during this pandemic, America needs to know Vincent Chin's story. According to a recent study by the Asian American Foundation, one out of three Americans do not believe that there's been a rise in anti-Asian hate or sentiment in the past year. And an increasing percentage of Americans are questioning the loyalty of Asian Americans and continue to blame us for the pandemic. How can we expect America to address anti-Asian hate and racism when so many Americans can't even recognize that it's happening? If we want to stop the scapegoating of Asian Americans every time as a continuous pattern when this country feels threatened, whether by foreign powers or by disease, America must start to teach Asian American studies. 
We need a wake-up call in this country. Now, as at Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA, we are continuing to build on the legacy that our, our founder, Stuart Quo, brought to this organization. We have helplines in eight, in eight languages and dialects so that victims can receive support in language. We provide direct services, including, including legal representation to our most vulnerable community members to support them, not just with anti-Asian hate and discrimination, but other areas of post-COVID recovery as well, whether that's immigration, housing, public benefits. And because we know we have allies who do care about our community, we offer bystander intervention trainings where you can learn how to safely intervene and support a victim if you were to witness one being harassed. To date, over 175,000 people have been trained across this country on our five Ds for bystander intervention. And if you would also like to be trained, you can go to our website at www.advancingjustice-la.org to sign up for a free public training as well. As we remember Vincent Chin's legacy, we also mourn the lives lost to racial hatred in Atlanta, Indianapolis, Buffalo, and too many others to name. Yet in the face of hate, our communities continue to rise in resilience. Your action to be here today at this event shines a light that we will not tolerate hate in this country. Today, it has never been more important to stay united with our allies and, and be allies with our communities of color to keep up the fight to dismantle white supremacy and racial injustice. And so I thank you for being part of this growing movement in this country who, is, who are challenging the status quo and fighting for a better tomorrow. Now, being the successor of Stuart Quo was no easy feat. You see this man who still looks good when you compare the videos and he is today, and he still sounds good when you listen to him speak on this podium. And he's a certified genius. And so that was not shoes that I uh, enthusiastically jumped into when I decided to become the CEO of Advancing Justice LA. But when this pandemic hit and we saw our community being scapegoated and attacked, and when we saw the murder of George Floyd and through the Black Lives Matter movement, our country's reckoning around systemic racism and anti-blackness, it was a call that I could not turn away because we are living in a moment in history during this pandemic and all of us will need to reckon to future generations who ask us, what was this pandemic like? What were you doing? when we saw the rise in anti-Asian hate? What were you doing when we saw the Black Lives Matter movement uh, becoming in the forefront of our society? And so thank you for being here and showing your part and your commitment to a better future and a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And now um, we want to show you a clip of uh, a film that was nominated for the uh, Academy Award for the best documentary, uh, Who Killed Vincent Chin? So go ahead and let that roll. I think the Vincent Chin murder was shocking to a lot of Asian Americans, not because it represented something new, but that it actually represented something old. It reminded Asian Americans that progress hadn't really been made. In 1882, you could kill a, quote, China man and get off paying a dollar. In 1982, you can kill an Asian American and get off paying $3,000. This was not justice, but there wasn't an organization that existed to stand up and say, this is wrong. What 
began out of that was meetings that started with four people, 10 people, 20 people, 100 people. And people were talking about, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? I raised my hand and I said, the world wants to know how the Asian American community feels about this. In depth, Vincent Chin inspired protest marches, rallies, dinners, banquets. The killing of Vincent Chin is probably the most tragic example of the kind of violence that's being committed against Asians. Civil rights organizations of every kind came forward, as well as individuals. We have been drawn together by death, an unplanned family reunion, a heart made heavy by a mother who sits here with us, whose son was brutally killed just because he was. What can we do in the aftermath? Those who live, we must redefine America so everybody knows everybody fits in the rainbow somewhere. So what you just saw was the uh, PBS a groundbreaking five-hour docu-series um, called Asian Americans. It's a collaboration of Asian American filmmakers, scholars, community, and public media. And uh, the series producer and showrunner is Renee Tajima Pena, who I'd like to call up. Oh, she's here uh, to the stage. And I want to also say, yes, give it up for her. I want to also say that we are going to see a little bit later uh, clips from the film Who Killed Vincent Chin? Who, uh, which is, as I mentioned, the uh, Academy Award-nominated uh, film. But her other films uh, include My America, or Honk If You Love Buddha, one of my favorites, personally, Calavera Highway, S uh, Skate Manzanar, Labor Women, and No Mas Bebes, which explores themes of immigration, race, ethnicity, gender, and social justice. Um, her films have uh, screened all around the world, and uh, we are fortunate that we were able to honor her uh, as the Human Relations Commission not long ago for her work. So I'm just so pleased that she can join us today. So let's uh, give a warm welcome to Renee Tajima Pena. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just came back, actually, from a four-day commemoration of the legacy of Vincent Chin in Detroit. Um, that's where I got this. I would encourage everybody, Helen Dia wrote it, the Vincent Chin Legacy Guide. It's like the definitive guide to the Vincent Chin case and also the context of the civil rights movement. And that commemoration was just really life-changing in a lot of ways. Um, it really made me rethink the fight ahead. It was organized by Helen, uh, Jim Shimura, who you saw in Curtis's film, um, Roland Wong, people who have were there at the beginning with American Citizens for Justice uh, 40, 39 years ago, and who are still a part of the fight. And a lot of young people, new generations from all over who are carrying on that legacy. And, and it really made me rethink that legacy in terms of today. 35, maybe 36 years ago, when I interviewed Ron Evans, who murdered Vincent Chin, and inter I interviewed him in his house in Detroit, and what struck me about Ron at that time is he seemed so normal. And you know, growing up, I had always thought of uh, racist hate riding in on a horse with a Klan hood. But here he was riding in on a Chrysler. And then I realized at this event, and now we see racist violence riding in on like a Prius. I mean, it's become so normalized today, and people have talked about how normalized that racist violence is, and that is a part of our fight ahead. It was our fight 40 years ago. It's our fight today. I, I have three things, just like Stuart does. I, I don't know, maybe I should have been a lawyer. But 
The second thing is, you know, that federal civil rights prosecution really was so groundbreaking because it was for the first time Asian Americans in that um, uh, uh, civil rights criminal prosecution were recognized as a protected class. In other words, we were recognized as being targets of racism, which was news to a lot of people. That's how we've been gaslit for generations and generations. People just didn't believe, they thought we were the model minority, and you know we didn't suffer any racism despite our history. But then, that was a great achievement on the part of that movement for justice. Today, all civil rights protections, one by one, are under threat are being rolled back. So just like 40 years ago, that's our fight ahead, is defending those protections and expanding those protections. And I might add that the Vincent Chin case helped to open doors for civil rights protections for LGBTQ Americans, for Latinos, for immigrants, for people with disabilities, and for other Americans. And finally, I'm glad that uh, Connie and Stewart talked about education. The Vincent Chin story was so important back then to convince people you know, about the civil rights prosecution, to convince people of the true history of Asian Americans and our, our experience with systemic racism and white supremacy. We had to tell our own story. We had to tell that history. But today, even telling our history is under threat. You know, they call it the anti-critical race theory. It really is a backlash against ethnic studies. It's a backlash in, against telling our own story as Asian Americans and insisting that our story is a part of the larger American story. But you know, we have books like, if you're familiar with the children's book, Lawrence Yep's Dragon Wings, are you familiar with that? It's about a you know, young Chinese American boy in Chinatown in the early, yeah, tell Asian American stories. In the early 1900s, his father dreams of building a flying machine, and it's true to the times of, Chi this was during the middle of Chinese exclusion. In different school districts, Dragon Wings has been banned. So, while we try to tell the, our story, the Vincent Chin history and all our history, in places like California, we've made gains, in Illinois, in Connecticut, in New Jersey, but all around the country, there is a backlash against our histories and backlash against the histories of people of color. And that, again, is our fight ahead in solidarity, insisting that we tell our own stories, insisting that our story is a part of the American story. And so gathering here today, telling our story, recognizing and fighting against these, these rollbacks in the gains of the civil rights movement and the gains of these movement and the movements for equality, that is an act of resistance. You here today, we here together, it's an act of resistance. And as the other speakers have said, carry on that resistance. And I also want to acknowledge um, the Cal Poly Pomona people, Mary Yu Danico and all your posse here who are a part of writing this guide. She's the one, if you heard somebody screaming about Curtis, hi Curtis, oh and hi Paula, hi, oh, there's so many people here. Um, that was us screaming. But thank you so much and um, I don't want to say I hope you enjoy the clip of Who Killed Vincent Chin, but I hope that you watch it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And by the way, I didn't mention that you can, you can uh, see uh, the Asian America um, and uh, on pbs.org. If you go there, um, it's available to be screened. So um, it makes it easy for you and to share it with others. Um, to the point uh, that Renee was making about normalizing, not allowing us to normalize hate, I did want to point out that one of the ways we can do that is simply, if we don't report hate, we're accepting it. We're allowing it to be part of our, our world. And I just wanted to hold this up, this poster, which says, Together Against Hate, reporting uh, hate to 211. 
That is the number. 211 is the number to call or LA versus A.org. That is the way you take a very simple act of standing up to hate and making clear that we do not accept it in our, in our county, in our city, uh, nowhere in this country or world. I have the pleasure uh, now of uh, calling up uh, our uh, featured speaker, George Gascon, our district attorney. He is an attorney and former police officer, yes, and police chief of many decades. He served as a district attorney of San Francisco from 2011 to 2019, and prior to his work as a prosecutor, he was an assistant chief of police for the LAPD and chief of police in Mesa, Arizona and San Francisco. He's a critical ally in our fight against hate crimes, whom we trust and know uh, we, uh, we believe in, that yeah, he believes in our cause. So we are so uh, happy to have him here today. Let's welcome uh, District Attorney George Gascon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Robin and the Human Relations Commission and the uh, Chinese American Museum for the work that you do day in and day out. And Stuart, uh, you have been my hero for many years. And uh, the work that you have done has been an inspiration for many people. And we deeply appreciate your work. You know, um, we're here to commemorate 40 years, right, of a horrible event that occurred in Detroit. But the reality is that history continues to repeat itself. We have seen it over and over again. We have seen the increase in hate crimes against the Asian American community, but we've also seen it against the LGBTQ community, the African American community, the Latino community, and I can go on and on and on. Just recently in North Hollywood, and I heard Connie talk about the incident in Koreatown a couple of days ago, but about a week ago, 10 days ago, we had another incident in North Hollywood, which we're prosecuting, uh, where the Roque family was just on a drive-through waiting to buy some fast food, and a minor collision led to an incredible act of hate. Unfortunately, thanks to a good Samaritan, Mr. Roque was not more seriously injured. And we have to stop and think about it because we're not any better than we were 40 years ago. What the pandemic has done is simply rise to the surface the hate that continues to be a part of the legacy of our country. You heard the fact that while very commendable, we're trying to establish more education and have more kids learn about the history and the legacy of the Asian American community, there are so many states that are actually prohibiting this type of education from taking place. And unless we all stand together firmly, and unless we all say one hate incident against one of us, it's a hate incident against all of us. Together, we will prevail, or if we choose to segregate one another, we will all perish one by one. You know, I listened to the words of Reverend Jackson when he talked during the Detroit uh, incident, and he talked about there has to be a place on that rainbow for each and every one of us. Well, there still isn't a place on that rainbow for each and every one of us. I am here to tell you that I'm very committed to doing our work in holding people accountable that engage in crimes of hate. But it's so much more than just simply arresting or prosecuting our way out of it. We must, we must continue to stand up together. We must come to events like this. We must be loud and clear. 
we must demand from our legislators, we must demand from employers, we must demand from our educators that there is a place for each and every one of us in that rainbow. And until that place is a reality, we must all continue to fight. So thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here with you, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, District Attorney Gaspon. And we hope that people will take the time to, to really learn about his journey and what he stands for um, in this coming period. We know there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. Um, now I want to, uh, to bring up someone who is uh, here, from here, a native of Los Angeles County, uh, Salome Agbaroji. And she is a Youth Commission poet that finds joy in writing and performing poetry that urges social change and community action. She focuses on themes of racism, oppression, femininity, and Christianity and inclusion. She's the youngest ever participant and winner of the Ill List Poetry Slam and was part of the Get Lit team that won uh, second place in the Brave New Voices Slam, the world's largest youth poetry competition. We met her at the LA Youth Poet Laureate event, which the commissioner supported for many years. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Salome Agbaroji. Hello, I'm very happy to be here. Um, personally, it's just beautiful to see such a multi-generational and community-oriented display of civic responsibility when we see instances of injustice and decide to take a stance about it. Um, I'll be performing a poem called are we there yet? Look out the window and see concrete jungles where you are deemed most dangerous beast. And when street cops turn kings top of food chain looking for a feast, these roads seem a bit more treacherous. So you ask, Ma, are we there yet? She says zilch and doesn't flinch besides the bounce of potholes. You know treachery, you came from the jungle, but this different type of danger sits stiffly in your soul. You realize this highway is caution tape on indigenous land, a graveyard of Asian workers covered in concrete quicksand and a tombstone for the missing girl whose search party quit last week. These roads are guilt, gluttony, and taxpayer money, and that doesn't feel right, so you've got to ask again. Mama, are we there yet? She says nothing, and windshield wipes away the acid rain from her eyes. We have rain in the jungle. We just tuck the clouds deep within the canopy cavity of our tear ducts to stay alert for lions red for meat and for forks in the road. Look through the bars of this moving cell and see cages pass faster than time does. One group, black panthers from the jungle, carpool through the center of the interstate. I don't know, some weird middle passage or something. Another group, children on the outside looking in, denied access because their parents didn't have the proper driver's license. You start to develop road rage and that doesn't feel right so you've got to ask again. Ma, there have been many bumps in the road, so are we there yet? They took Vincent Chin through the exit 40 miles back, and we've been driving for 400 years, and I'm getting car sick, so mommy, please, are we there yet? Ma replies, are we where yet? Because the future is a gas bill, or the truth, or death, or a merciless God. It is a hyena, ruthless, evil, salivating from the mouth, waiting to pounce on any creature in its path. The future, no matter how fast we drive, it is coming. So quit running your mouth in the back seat like you've got some place to be. We take this ride and we take it cautiously. Now listen when I speak. If you see flashing lights and hear three beeps, halt expeditiously. 
make your hands visible to not come off too threatening and just pray that sitting in this traffic doesn't make you too dark or make the cops too hungry because royalty must eat. Don't make a meal of yourself. This claustrophobic caravan wasn't built for this departure, but this horn is an emancipation proclamation, a key to child cages and higher minimum wages. These lights are a search party and tax reform. This is justice and hope. The gas pedal, a time machine to when cars have a gear that spells power, an exhaust that never tires, tires that never wear despite the miles per hour. These wheels are the movement. This will, fueled by the heartbeat under the pavement, is the ignition. We drive. GPS set destination, future. Are we there yet? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Salome. I really appreciate that you have taken something that I heard growing up as a parent, or not growing up, as a parent with my kids growing up in the car asking me that question to something that is now infused with meaning about our path to social justice. Thank you. I want to now welcome our next speaker. Um, Manjusha Kulkarni is the executive director of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders Equity Alliance, AAPI Equity, which serves and represents the 1.5 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Los Angeles County. In March 2020, uh, Manju co-founded Stop AAPI Hate, along with um, her partners in Northern California, and that's the nation's leading aggregator of COVID-19 related incidents, hate incidents against AAPIs. In 2021, Manju was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the most influential individuals and by Bloomberg Business Week as one of the 50 individuals with the ability to move markets or shape ideas and policies along with the co-founders of Stop API Hate. Her work's been featured in the New York Times and on CBS News and CNN, as well as in numerous ethnic media outlets. And she's a member of the LA City Ethics Commission and was recently appointed to the California Racial and Identity Profiling Advisory Board by California Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon. And in March 2021, she testified before Congress at the House Judiciary Committee on the issue of anti-Asian hate. So uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Manju Kulkarni. Thank you, Robin. We're here today to mark the 40th anniversary of the horrific killing of Vincent Chin. In April, we commemorated the 30th anniversary of Saegu. In March, we observed the first anniversary of the Atlanta and the Indianapolis killings. And we also observed the second anniversary of the founding of Stop AAPI Hate. As Robin mentioned, it was co-founded by my organization, AAPI Equity Alliance, with Chinese for Affirmative Action in San Francisco State. And sadly, over the two-year period, we have received over 11,000 incident reports from all across the nation, all 50 states, and the District of Columbia. These are verbal harassment cases, workplace discrimination, discrimination in retail, bullying of students in schools, and in some cases, physical attacks. A thousand of those incidents have taken place right here in Los Angeles County. Vincent Chin's death and the aftermath and the conditions that we are living under today with anti-AAPI hate have revealed to us not simply the individual acts of hate and violence against our communities, but also the injustices of policies, the injustices of our courts, of, our, of legislation, local, state, and federal policies that allow for profiling and surveillance of our communities, mass deportations, and voter suppression and voter nullification unlike anything we've ever seen before. 
And what happened also in 1982 and what is happening today, what we are seeing is the resistance and the resilience of our communities. We are hearing the voices of the young, the old. We know that we are loud. We know that in 1982, we began to see the modern Asian American movement flourish. And again, now we see our community standing up to the hate that is showered upon us. What we've also seen as part of that resistance and resilience is policies that do address the needs of our communities. We have at the state level the API equity budget that has brought $166 million to our communities. Stop API Hate has two bills in the legislature now as part of the No Place for Hate California platform. And here in Los Angeles, we're fortunate to have LA versus Hate. Our voices are more critical today than they've ever been before. Just today, the Supreme Court of the United States eviscerated our right to safety and our right to Miranda protections, that is constitutional protections against much of what we see in terms of police violence. And we know sadly that next week, we are very likely, 170 million of us, to lose the right to bodily integrity. And we have seen over the course of the last few weeks through congressional hearings, not simply an insurrection, but an attempted coup to overturn the will of the people. Our communities have worked in solidarity after the uprising, after the murder of George Floyd, and now more recently after Buffalo and Uvalde. We must continue to show that solidarity. Every single one of us must join in the fight, not simply to stop AAPI hate, but to ensure the continuation of our democracy. Please join me in that fight. We need every single one of you and millions of the rest of us to fight for the land that is ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manju, for that and for all your leadership during this difficult period of, of anti-Asian hate. I wanted to um, uh, now turn to uh, an excerpt from Vincent Hu. Um, and uh, so I'll ask you to turn your attention to the screens. A little switch in our order of things. Uh, we have two talented musicians with us today. Um, Mr. Hao Wang Bao, a nationally recognized Erhu virtuoso, and Erhu is a two-string instrument that you'll see in a moment. And accompanying him is his wife, um, Chao Xiao Ching, on the pipa instrument. They'll be playing a song of sorrow, which unfortunately is very appropriate for uh, this moment as we think of Vincent Chin and his case.
Thank you. Let's, let's give them another hand for that just incredibly beautiful but sad music. It's one thing hearing it, another thing seeing it, seeing it performed. It was really uh, wonderful to see. Our next speaker is Paula Yu, who is an award-winning book author, TV writer, producer, and feature screenwriter. She's a former journalist, having worked for the Seattle Times, the Detroit News, and People Magazine. She graduated with a BA cum laude in English from Yale University, an MS in journalism from Columbia University. And most importantly, she's the author of the book, From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry, The Killing of Vincent Chin, and the Trial that Galvanized the Asian American Movement. So please join me in welcoming Paula Yu. I'm a little short, so I have to, <laughs> thank you. Oh. Okay, we're good. I think you can hear. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you again uh, for inviting me to this very beautiful and powerful ceremony. It is an honor to be here. But what about Vincent Chin? That was the first question that came into my mind in the summer of 1993 when I was offered a job to be a reporter for the Detroit News. That was also the same question that popped into the head of many other of my Asian American journalist friends as well, because it was 1993, barely a decade after Vincent Chin had been killed. And I'm a Gen Xer, so like many Gen X Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we first learned about Vincent Chin through our first Asian American studies course in college or from Renee's powerful documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chin? Um, but unfortunately, his name was starting to disappear in the 1990s. It was really, uh, his name was kind of fading out of the national consciousness. And I want to fast forward to uh, about 10 years ago when Curtis Chin's also equally powerful documentary, Vincent Who, came out because that new generation of young college students were not aware of who he was. And unfortunately, this did not surprise me because throughout my life, Asian American Pacific Islander history and literature is often rarely taught at all in our kindergarten through 12th grade classrooms. Um, we're lucky if we're a chapter or we get a sidebar on, say, something like uh, the illegal incarceration of the Japanese Americans during World War II. It's just like a little tiny thing and then they move on. And the problem with that is it makes it seem as if we do not exist. So when it, as a result, when I graduated high school, I had this desire and this hunger to fill in the gaps I am mostly self-taught when it comes to Asian American history, literature, and pop culture. This erasure of our history and our contributions to American history is why Asian Americans are constantly stereotyped and wrongly viewed as the perpetual foreigner. It's as if we don't truly belong here when we do. This pandemic is a harsh reminder of that. During the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, my family members reported passengers requesting to be seated away from them on airplanes. Friends and I shared stories of being called racist slurs by random strangers on the street and being blamed for the virus. Among all the statistics on the spike in pandemic-related anti-Asian racism, one stood out in particular to me and broke my heart. It was from the Stop AAPI Youth campaign where they found out that one out of four Asian American Pacific Islander children and teenagers reported being verbally, physically harassed, and bullied because of this pandemic. Imagine if Asian American Pacific Islander history was actually taught in our schools on a regular basis. Perhaps that number today would have been zero. This is why Vincent Chin's story must be told, and this is what inspires me to write nonfiction books about Asian American history, including my latest book for high school students, From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry, The Killing of Vincent Chin, and the Trial that Galvanized the Asian American Movement, which was published just last year uh, by Norton Young Readers, which is the children's imprint of W.W. Norton and Company. It's won many awards, including being nominated for the National Book Award. But I wanted to say, this book is not just a retelling of the Vincent Chin story. It's not a simplified story. You know, I, I don't shy away from the brutal facts of the crime. I also do live reporting as a former reporter and journalist, so there's a lot of new information in my book, and one of them, it tells two parallel storylines. One is of the Vincent Chin story. The other one is of a young man named Jared, 
he was someone I interviewed, and I was told, oh, he's related to Vincent Chin. And so when I interviewed him, I said, hey, I'd like to find out your relationship to Vincent Chin's family. And he said, Vicki Wong is my mother. And that's when I knew he had to be a part of my book because it wasn't until the 30th anniversary of Vincent Chin, which is in 2012, his cousin called Jared and said, dude, today's the big anniversary. Don't talk to your mom about that guy. And Jared said, what guy? And his cousin said, Vincent Chin. And Jared said, who's Vincent Chin? So he Googled Vincent Chin on the computer, and he told me, when that photo came up, the newspaper photo that you saw in these documentaries where Vincent has his arm around his beautiful fiance, Vicki Wong, Jared turned to me and said, I recognize my mom immediately. So my book also follows his journey in trying to talk to his mother about this painful secret past that she had because he tells her, Mom, we have to know about Vincent Chin. So on this 40th anniversary of Vincent Chin's legacy, I would like to close by reading the poem Vincent Chin wrote for his fiance, Vicki Wong, for Valentine's Day. It was published on February 14, 1979 in the Detroit Free Press Classified section. During my research for my book about his life, legacy, and case, Lily Chin was quoted in several articles saying that at one point, Vincent wanted to be a writer. He was a bookworm. As a child, he loved reading in the library. Um, I when I interviewed his best friend Gary, he said they used to hide out in the library as kids and read comic books all the time, and he became a huge fan in high school of those big, thick James Mishner novels. Um, and friends often describe Vincent as always having his nose in a book. So, as a writer, I am reading his poem in honor of Vincent's childhood dream of becoming a writer, because his voice matters and his voice must be heard. This is the poem he wrote. It is called Vicky. My love for you is like a fire that glows in my heart, so bright when we're together, so very dim when we're apart. The fire will last forever, and my love will never die, as long as we have each other, as long as we both try. There is no life without you. There is no joy or laughter. There is no brightness, no warmth, all the mornings after. So stay with me, and we'll face the tomorrows to find if our love can overcome the sorrows. Remember me always, for my love for you is true. There isn't anyone else. I love you. Happy Valentine's Day. Love, Vincent. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Paula. I really encourage you, um, if you're at all wanting to share the knowledge and memory of Vincent Chin's case, to get Paula's book. Um, because I think it's the most current um, and in-depth um, retelling and, and investigation of, of that case. So um, I hope that you'll, you'll follow up on that. Our next speaker is Jose Calderon. He's a professor emeritus of sociology and Chicano, Chicano, Latino, Latina studies at Pitzer College. Honored recently as first district uh, leader among, um, during Hispanic Heritage Month, he's a scholar and community leader who combines academic research and writing with community activism. He's the son of immigrant farm workers from Mexico and has had a long history of connecting his organizing and academic work with community-based teaching participatory action research, critical pedagogy, and engagement. Uh, Jose has advanced the building of community-based leadership and development of a day labor center, something that I had the pleasure to work with him on, the defense of immigrant rights, and the continued building of human rights coalitions. He is the president of the Latino and Latina Roundtable of the San Gabriel and Pomona Valley, and a longtime friend and civil rights uh, icon. Let's welcome Jose Calderon. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak on this 40th anniversary of the murder of Vincent Chin. And I thank for so many of you for staying this late. Uh, the poetry that you gave really got to my heart. 
Stuart, as always, your words inspire us to keep going no matter how old we get and to our dying breath, we continue to live the legacy that this movement, not only to remember Vincent Chin, but to remember all those who have died unjustly and have resulted in movements that today are growing. You know, since the 1980s, when I was working on a PhD at UCLA, and I have to thank individuals like Marshall Wong, who spurred me on to come from Colorado and work on a PhD. Since that time, I have always used the film Who Killed Vincent Chin in all my classes, not only to teach about the life of a 27-year-old Chinese immigrant who, like me, came to this country and did everything possible to try and make the world better for our family. He did it alongside his mother, Lily Chen, and family to succeed, but who became an example of the racial scapegoating that our historically excluded groups have faced in this country's institutions and legal system. As with other immigrants of color who have come to this country in times of economic crisis, it has been a consistent pattern to blame us when the economy goes bad or when our labor is not needed. We're loved for our labor, but when we're not needed, we're hated. We all understand, and I have to point this out today, this is important, and we can't go into it too deeply, but that this maltreatment has its roots in the early colonization that occurred in many of what we called our third world countries. We call them the countries in the South now. We have had the same commonality, whether from Asia, Latin America, or Africa, where our countries were taken over by countries who represented what we now call the North, and with white supremacy in the forefront used to grease the wheels of capital, we built these countries. Those considered surplus labor, like my father, who actually ended up baptized right here in this church, were systematically forced to migrate abroad. Those were the ones who couldn't be used for the corporations in those countries. And again, their labor was used in the north. They're gathering right now, right on that side of Tijuana, Haitians from El Salvador, from Guatemala, from all our Central American countries, even from China, in places like the US. Vincent represented those immigrants who through community organizing efforts challenged unjust immigration laws and through policies such as the 1965 Hart Seller Act, were able to come to the US and began to make a life. As all of you know, in Vincent's case, he was born in Wandong. He grew up in Detroit from the time he was a child and was excelling in computer graphics. And this was a time in the early 1980s when the automotive manufacturing industry, as was pointed out, was in decline alongside both an energy and an oil crisis. And rather than blaming the roots of capital of the economic downturn, they blamed the Japanese car manufacturers. I remember the billboards, and you'll remember them too, on the freeways at that time. When I was driving to UCLA, calling to buy American by the General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler corporations, and blaming layoffs and hiring slowdowns on Japan. And I remember thinking at that time, it was reminiscent of the propaganda and the concentration camps that our Japanese communities had to go through in the 1940s. They were reminiscent of our Mexican origin families, many here who in these trains were loaded up, a million immigrants blamed for the depression and shipped back to Mexico many of them US citizens. We today know the result of that scapegoating that reached media proportions and the resulting death of Vincent Chin by two white men 
a, a Chrysler plant supervisor, and his stepson, reminiscent of the kind of thinking that is out there of our right wing today, a laid off auto worker who, believing that Vincent was Japanese, beat him to death and ultimately got off with only a $3,000 fine and no prison time. This case would have ended there, brothers and sisters, had it not been for you, for the organized protests throughout the country, the strength of the mother, you're right, Stuart, the making of the film, Who Killed Vincent Chin? Thank you, Tajima, Renee Tajima Pena, the journalist, Helen Zia, and lawyers such as Stuart Quo. Thank you so much for building a coalition, a multiracial coalition led by the American Citizens for Justice. We celebrate this example today of organizing and resistance that on the legal front did result in the end in a civil suit, in a civil suit settlement. But most importantly, we celebrate today the result of organized examples throughout the country of multiracial coalitions of defense, of resistance. Every time the scapegoat goading tactics and the specter of white supremacy reared its head. In my case, and with some of you here today, I know Mike Ng is here, we were able to beat back what I call the first Trump in Monterey Park back in the 1980s, who led an English-only movement and passed a law in the middle of the night that only English could be used in the entire city. We were able to beat that back with a multiracial coalition called the Coalition for Harmony in Monterey Park, led by individuals like Mike, like Stuart, like many of you who are here. It led to the defeat of Barry Hatch, the election of Judy Chu, and the establishment of multicultural and more just economic policies. In fact, on the second floor of the Chinese American Museum, you'll find an entire room devoted to that history of Monterey Park. We cannot remember, we cannot forget what it took to turn around that right wing direction that targeted Chinese as well as Latinos for the economic injustices that were occurring in this country. This was also true in our schools where fights between the different ethnic groups were turned into fighting the dropout rate, the absentee rates, and along the side, the establishment of a multicultural curriculum. Gay UN was one of those leaders of those movements at that time. There are so many examples, brothers and sisters, that have emerged since the killing of Vincent Chin. There are too many to mention here, but I do want to mention one right now. You know, in some places, I live in the city of San Dimas, there are places still in the suburbs that have the character of the Black Belt South. I live in a city of San Dimas where never in the history of San Dimas has there been a person of color elected to the city council and only one white woman. You walk into the city council, the entire wall is white men. And I just want to laud people like Jeanette Ellis Royston and the NAACP, the Latino and Latina Roundtable, who not only threatened to take that city to court, with a Southwest voter, we united in also taking Laverne and Ontario to court for the same reasons, and we won. So that th that city of San Dimas in the last election was just transformed from an at-large city to a district city. And I want you to know that we, for the first time, made history in San Dimas by electing the first person of color, Eric Nakano, to the city council. And we already have in place for 2024 a member of the NAACP with Jeanette, James Shirley, 
to run for the other district we created. And David Estrada from the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement for another district. We're already running them so that by 2024, we are going to be the majority in San Dimas. And brothers and sisters, I have to tell you that that is the legacy of Vincent Chin, how we turn around racial hate, AAPI hate in that city. And Jeanette knows it was the Minutemen who showed up in Glendora, in San Dimas, in Pomona. When the city attorney asked in Glendora, what should we do about the immigrants? 90 of them began to chant, kill them all, kill them all. This was published in the newspaper, but in every one of those cities, Pomona, Claremont, San Dimas, Glendora, we were able to stop them from having the city council join an amicus brief to end sanctuary. We defeated them. The city councils refused to join that amicus brief, and we still have as a law sanctuary in this state as a result of those struggles. That is the legacy of Vincent Chen. And most recently, to fight those kind in those cities, we have all been part of marches from Pomona to Claremont to Alhambra to Los Angeles to beat back the placing of blame for the coronavirus on our AAPI communities and, again, our Chinese community. This has gone along with right-wing groups who in our city have called it the China COVID, telling people not to wear masks or to get vaccinated because it violates their democratic rights. While well, we are turning that around, we are turning this into this form of resistance, this form of organizing. This is still going on, and the spread of thinking that is scapegoating our API, API communities has to be stopped because it places the safety of our community in jeopardy, and it only serves to divide us. We need to turn around the, our power of being able to vote in those multiracial coalitions and ensure that we vote in people who truly represent the interests of our communities. We celebrate the legacy of Vincent Chin and the movement that has developed since in bringing all of us together to raise our voices, to stop the hate, to stand together in support of our AAPI communities, our AAPI businesses, our immigrant families of all colors, to build multiracial unity, and most importantly, to finish, to not just deal with the symptoms of racist rhetoric and racism and hate, but to turn around the systemic causes of racism to turn around the historical sources of racial and economic disparities that it pit us one against the other to fight for diminishing resources. We need to respond as we are doing here today, not only by remembering Vincent Chin, but to go out of here and to promise that this won't be a one-day thing, that we will elect the kind of people that truly represent our communities, and that we ensure that our labor, who is still being used, both here and abroad, and our contributions, and our resources, and our history in those ethnic studies programs continue, and that we have in the forefront our quality of life in the interest of our communities. Long live the legacy of Vincent Chin. Long live our multiracial unity. And we will not wait. Stop the hate. Thank you, brothers and sisters. All right, Jose, thank you so much for reminding us the many ways in which we can honor the legacy of Vincent Chin. And I want to ask all of you to, to just stay as long as you uh, are able to a little bit longer. But we do want to pay our respects to Vincent Chin. We have an altar here. Uh, that we are going to uh, ask you to, to uh, visit and, uh, and to show your respect. So uh, I want to turn us to our next part of the program, which is I told you that uh, we had uh, clips from the uh, Academy Award-nominated 
uh, film, uh, Who Killed Vincent Chin, and I want to show that to you right now. So take a look at your monitors. Ngoi For the early uh, Asian immigrants who came to Detroit, there was the hope of the auto industry and the, and the prosperity that they might be able to gain from that. Uh, some of them got jobs in the auto plants, but I think for the most part it was in service industries uh, around the, uh, all of the higher paying work in Detroit. Primarily for Chinese, it was uh, laundries and restaurants. So for uh, Asians who came here, they were looking for the same thing. A hope, a promise, uh, a dream of a better life. Over time, that began to change as more and more educated uh, immigrants came over, I think probably after the 1940s and 1950s. Um, they too sought jobs in the auto industry as engineers. And I think the dream for many of them was that if they did their work, uh, were quiet, tried their hardest to assimilate and not make waves or cause trouble, that they too could have a, uh, a hope of a of the great American dream. Of blending in the melting pot, getting their piece of the pie. Give a hand to uh, Renee Tajima Pena for that clip of her Academy Award nominated documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chin? And I encourage everyone to search for it online and, and watch it in its full entirety. Let me now welcome to the stage um, Ron Wakabayashi, who is the former regional director of the Community Relations Service of the US Department of Justice 
Previous to that, he was uh, the executive director of the LA County Human Relations Commission, my predecessor. Um, before that, he was the head of the Los Angeles City Human Relations Commission. Before that, he was the national director of the Japanese American Citizens League, uh, one of the oldest uh, civil rights organizations in the country. Um, a mentor and a friend, uh, I want to welcome someone who has been involved with the social justice struggles throughout our history, Ron Wakabashi. Let's, let's welcome him. Thank you, Mr. Tomo. Actually, I used to work for Robin's dad when I was in, in college, so there's a lot of incestuous relationships. You know, I want to congratulate everyone for toughing it out this far. You know, we're two, we're two days off from the longest day of the year, and we're here long enough that we have to turn on the lights for the longest day of the year. I, you know, I, I applaud you for, for your patience and your support. I'll, I, you know, like, um, all the things that, have, that really need to be said have been said already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time up here. I just want to cap on, I just have an obligation to follow up what uh, Gay asked me to do, and I'll do that. But my first reference is, this is an old document. This is from 1985. I was a director of the Japanese American Citizens League, and we were in touch with the Chin case uh, in several ways. Jim Shimura was our chapter president in Detroit. He called. He said, we need help. Now, in, in 1985, the, the JCL was involved in our major federal campaign for reparations for the wartime incarceration. So we were pretty occupied with a major campaign ourselves. But I, I really want to kind of credit our chapters. Jim, I asked Jim, you know, what can we do? What do you need? And Jim says, we need money to get this on. We have no money. To the credit, within a few months, our chapters dr literally sent in thousands of dollars while there was their own, their own campaign for the wartime internment was taking place. Um, and while I was a director of the agency, I had my own skepticism about my own organization. I have a great deal of pride that they took that kind of action when they had like a, um, you know, a holy grail kind of issue of their own to take on. But, but you know, this report that, that we put together, Vincent Chin is, is a two-line annotation in here. It's a, and this report is titled, A Report on Anti-Asian Violence in the United States. This was not done in the Google era. The way this was done was that chapters of, of JCL throughout the country collected incidents and sent them into us. And we annotated and published it. After we published it, a guy named Norman Mineta, who is having a memorial service you know, down the street, uh, who's a former Secretary of Commerce, the former Secretary of, of Labor, of, of, I'm sorry, of Transportation, and who was the, the lead author of the, of the bill that, that gave you know, reparations for Japanese Americans, distributed it in the Congress. Now, what I brought in the packet, I'm not going to pull it all out. But subsequent to that, there was a whole series of things that took place. You know, what is Stop AAPI Hate today, and I was in San Francisco at the time, we had a coalition that developed that, that was called Break the Silence. And the same players, Chinese for Affirmative Action was involved with that in an Asian Law Caucus, uh, to develop you know, what Jose Calderon, I think, rightly pointed out to as a resistance, and that was the legacy. Like, but in this report, when, when, we uh, when you look at what's in here, the Chin case stands out as the marquee case. But there are hundreds of other cases going on. Even as the Chin case went forward and was a public and national you know, controversy, there were incidents. And there's a graphic picture I remember. College fraternity, Halloween, had a pumpkin. And they smashed that pumpkin with a baseball bat and put the sign Vincent Chin on there. They had a picture of Vincent Chin on that smashed pumpkin. Now, I, I had my own kind of little encounter and, and interaction with, with Mrs. Chin. While she was in San Francisco, I transported her to an event. She was in the car. And um, I hear her talking to back. And my mother-in-law is, is Toysan. So when she, talk, when she spoke English, what English she could speak, it was in the same accent that was so familiar to me. 
but I really couldn't understand very much of what she was saying. Um, my wife, who can understand it, sitting next to me, and she's quiet anyway, but I just see her sitting there tearing. And afterwards, when we take Mrs. Chen to the destination, Mrs. Chen you know, does this, say ude, ude, which I understood as thank you. But later I turned to my wife and said, what, why are you crying? And it's what you know, people cited earlier. What Mrs. Chin said, was saying in Chinese was, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. So Jose touched on, on the resistance, which I think is the main story, because there's not a story in being the victim. The story is in the response, and this community responded. The other part, though, that I wanted to touch on that, that uh, I think brought me here because of, of conversation with, with Ye is, you know, in the different roles that I've had, I've probably had more contact with hate crime victims than anyone, you know, in this arena. We, you know, the Community Relations Service is the lead agency on Shepherd Bird, the Federal Hate, hate Crime Act. So I've been in these environments. I knew no, Mrs. Mrs. Ileto as well. And what's shared in common is Mrs. Ileto, or Joseph Ileto, and Vincent Chin, we know some things about them. One of the other things about them that those mothers knew, as Vincent and Joseph were the boys that took care of mom. They're the boys that came home and took mom grocery shopping every week. They're the boys that kind of did the home repairs, checked on mom, called every day. Those are the sons that they lost, so they felt it. And I think that's, you know, part of the loss that, that is hard to say, you know, the, the, what was the uh, possibilities? What was the future? Let me kind of tie this off to my experience with hate crime and hate crime victims. Um, there's a woman that passed away two years ago in this city, a woman named Vicki Lindsay. Vicki Lindsay's son was a victim of a gang, gang killing. Her son was killed. She formed an organization of mothers whose sons and daughters were killed in violence, whether it was police violence or gang violence. And, you know, their meetings took place in South Central, and, and she asked me to come. And I anticipated it to be an all African American audience or group. And when I got there, that was not the case. It was clearly multiracial. And the bond that I saw among those women, because they shared the common experience of going through that tragedy, you know, crossed all other barriers. There was a strong, close, supportive bond among them. And that's kind of the resistance that we're talking about. Two other kind of examples of resistance, like Robin, when I was in your job, we had a hate crime in, in, um, in Norwalk at a community center, an Asian community center. And we walked into the center, and there was hate graffiti all over the place. And, and the place had just been vandalized. And it just felt awful. It felt violation, you know, like a real violation. And I stayed late that night, um, and the center decided that they were going to go ahead and not be deterred by this, and they were going to have go on with the usual events and let the kids have their practices and everything else. And I stood there by this young kid and, and her mother. So you, this little girl is a, about five years old, and she had on a, her little basketball uniform with number 23 on it, Michael Jordan. And her mother was telling, talking to her and saying, look, uh, we're going to let you go to practice, but don't you dare come out of this gym, young lady. Your father's going to come inside. If I hear that you came out of the gym, that you're going you're gonna, to you know, have a consequence for that. I think that's understandable behavior on the mom's part. But if you really think about that, what did the little girl hear? The little girl heard, be afraid. Be very afraid. Be afraid. And we talk about killing someone's spirit. That's the way to do it, be afraid. And while we don't recognize it, that's what starts happening. Because you know, as all these cri hate crimes are going on, our kids hear it. And you took it, look at the surveys, and they're afraid. You know, and that's got to be part of what we have to resist to. And then I think the concern of how you know, kids feel about it. In a different kind of I environment, and I'm, this is my last kind of example of it, uh, George Gascon was here. 
I was with George Gasco in the streets of, of, of Mesa, Arizona. You know, and the racist sheriff of our pile was raiding Mesa City Hall. And there's a face-off between George in his black uniform as the chief of Mesa PD and Sheriff Arpaio. So George has that history. But you know, the Arizona community went through such hatred during the, the 1070 immigration bashing. And I have, I have a, a goddaughter that lives you know, maybe a half a mile from here. Um, and she knew I was running to Arizona every other week working on, on the hate crimes there. And finally, one day, she said, you know, tell me what you do. So I tried to describe to her what we do. And she asked me one final question. This is a question that I'm going to leave you with and ask you to think about. Her question back to me is, Nino, why do they hate us? And I want you to think about that question, why she asked it, where that question came from, and how, her, how it made her feel. You know, I think it killed her spirit. So there's a lot to fight for, especially for our young people. Uh, Gay, thanks for the ch chance to have uh, the chance to do this. And I think I, I kept my promise. I stayed within five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. And I do want to say that um, we have 20, less than 20 minutes left in our Facebook live stream, at which point it will be cut off. And we, don't, we do want to include the vigil part, uh, candlelight vigil. So I'm going to respectfully ask all of our following speakers to really uh, be as uh, concise and brief as possible. So uh, with that, I'm going to call up um, Francisco Ortega, who is, who's been a senior staff member of the City of Los Angeles Human Relations Commission for over a decade. Um, he's a senior project coordinator for the Civil plus Human Rights and Equity Department uh, in the City of Los Angeles, and someone who's been a longtime ally. So with that, Francisco Ortega, let's welcome him. Well, um, you're the hardcore group. You, you're here. We, we got 20 minutes left, and, and then you're hearing from uh, some some guy at the city uh, level. Actually, been with the city human relations commission for about 17 years now. Um, uh, Robin doesn't get any older. I, I've gotten tremendously older. I think he's getting younger. Um, I, I wanted to answer the question: Are we there yet? From the poet laureate, and and, and we're in the car. It is bumpy. We're going to get there in a little bit. So I, I really appreciate everyone who's come before me tonight. I've been inspired sitting here. Just uh, the energy, the intellectual, uh, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, sentiment here uh, uh, regarding this, this vicious murder uh, 40 years ago. But le le let me just, uh, as, as uh, to honor uh, Robin, because I know how, how when we run uh, programs like this, you, you want expediency, but also uh, we want uh, also a message. So uh, hello again, and my name is Francisco, uh, and, and it, I am a, a honored to be here, right, for this 40th anniversary, and I do represent the new Civil Human Rights and Equity Department for the City of Los Angeles, and on behalf of uh, Capri Maddox, who couldn't be here tonight. She's our general manager, executive director. Um, we're r really, I mean, and our entire team, we're honored to be included in this, uh, in this event here tonight. I would like to start by thanking the organizers today. I, I want to thank, of course, the, the Human Relations Commission for the county, our, our counterpart, who does amazing work and has continued to do amazing work, and also the Chinese American Museum and uh, Gay UN. I, I mean, amazing work and amazing work in putting this uh, here together tonight. Uh, uh, Robin Toma has been a friend and a colleague for and a collaborator for many decades, uh, and so thank you, Robin, for including us tonight. The murder of Vincent Chin is one of the most uh, high-profile cases in anti-Asian uh, violence in American history, and and was, as many people have said before me tonight, significant significant for all the shortcomings, failures that exposed in the criminal justice system. And everyone, uh, all of, a lot of the speakers here tonight have highlighted that. The case is recognized for advancing new, but advancing new chapter in the Asian American civil rights movement. And I think that you've heard tonight, not only from filmmakers and artists and activists uh, and people, I mean, and competing uh, mariachi in the back as well. But uh, Vincent Chin's murder showed that Asian Americans were not immune to racist attacks and scapegoating. As with the other cases involving African Americans and Latinos, Shin was targeted only because of the twisted logic of racists who saw him as an enemy and an outsider. 
Evans and Nitz took their anger at globalization and chose to inflict physical violence on, um, on Detroiters who simply looked Asian and beating Vincent Chin to the death with a baseball bat. Vincent Chin was a good man. Uh, he had just been, uh, he was about to be married uh, and was starting a family. None of this mattered to Evans and Nitz who refused to see Vincent Chin's humanity. The light sentence that these two men received for such a brutal killing brought together for the first time Asian Americans across ethnic lines to form a multi-ethnic and multi-racial coalition to organize for civil rights uh, and to advocate for change in Detroit area and across the country. The Justice for Vincent Chin movement drew public attention to the rising tide of Japanese, Jap Japan bashing and anti-Asian violence and helped to generate a new wave of anti-racist activism and pan-Asian community organizing. For the first time in the Midwest, Asian Americans were leading a movement for social justice, getting media attention and raising awareness of the injustices facing Asian Americans. The Vincent Chin case illustrated that an immigrant, a Chinese American victim and Asian American victims were entitled to be cov covered by the provisions of the Civil Rights Act. The case demonstrates that no one is powerless, no one is invisible, invisible, entirely invisible, when we come together in solidarity to fight for justice. It illustrates also how Asian Americans are defying and reframing stereotypes, and they are more aware of the history and need for solidarity across different communities of color to combat systemic racism and white supremacy. And I'm ending here. Out of the struggles we find solidarity, out of pain we can build um, on progress. And let me just end by saying thank you again for this opportunity to be here on behalf of the LA Civil Rights Department and continue to build allyship and collaboration among all our stakeholders, everyone here tonight, and to make it known that Los Angeles is for everyone and that we will continue to be fierce advocates for equity, inclusion, diversity here in the city of Angels. So thank you so much for inviting us tonight and hope that we continue to uh, grow this movement that we've started. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francisco, and thank you to Capri Maddox and her leadership at that department. Uh, now we have with us um, Michael Lawson, who is the president of Ur the Urban League here in Los Angeles and a partner in the work for equality and social justice. Michael Lawson, are you here? Okay, so let me move on to our next speaker, who is Nancy Yap. She's executive director of the Center for Asian Americans United for Self-Empowerment, also known as CAUSE. And CAUSE is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to advancing the political and civic empowerment of the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Let's welcome Nancy Yap. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Yap, and as mentioned, I'm the executive director of CAUSE. I am Chinese Filipino from Ohio and grew up in a steel town impacted by the changing auto industry of the early 80s. Just a few of the ways I relate to Vincent Chin's story. There have been a number of events remembering this 40-year anniversary nationwide, and leaders and activists have shared their first reactions to this murder. For me, it was almost 15 years after the murder and verdict. I was horrified. I also felt like the microaggressions and racism I experienced in Ohio was seen through this story. I wasn't alone, and it wasn't everyone, but it could be anywhere, the blanket hate. Learning about not just Vincent Chin's murder, but also the community advocacy that followed inspired me to pursue work that focused on amplifying Asian and Pacific Islander, or API, stories, and do my part in preventing these types of events from happening again. And here we are, 40 years later, and APIs continue to feel unsafe as a result of their racial identity. According to the most recent multi-ethnic statewide poll conducted by CAUSE, Hispanics Organized for Political Equality, and the Los Angeles Urban League in April 2022, three out of four APIs are worried about being the victim of physical violence or a hate crime, the highest of any racial group. And just this morning, I read a story about a Filipino-American family in a McDonald's parking lot. 
experiencing racial slurs and violence in my neighborhood here in California. And I'm reminded again that this work, education, and policy advocacy continues to be necessary because isn't this what we have been working to prevent? And I have to remind myself that it is different now. I remind myself with data and community and hope because there is saddening optimism in data that shows that Californians of various racial backgrounds increasingly recognize that Asians are discriminated against from 55% in February 2020 to 71 in April 2022. This awareness came from more than just the stories about anti-Asian hate. It came from decades of organizing and advocacy, availability of information and education, and communities working together. The narratives of anti-Asian hate and violence that we have seen, heard, and felt in the past few years have been a catalyst for individuals to take action, to educate themselves, and to find ways to create positive change. In memory of Vincent Chin and many others who are no longer with us because of anti-Asian hate, we must continue to find solutions that prevent hate, and we must continue to build community at events like this one that commemorate Vincent Chin. It is at events like these that remind me of the continued importance of remembering and the work that I do at CAUSE. Thank you for holding this space, and thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you, Nancy. So um, we hope that you leave today with new knowledge and a renewed commitment to do what it takes to turn the tide of hate. And every one of us can do something in this regard. Uh, one of the things that I want to share that we've done and, um, is that we have worked with county government so that we are investing a million dollars to increase our capacity to fight pandemic-related hate. And I want to acknowledge Terry V. McDowell, the Commission's lead staff manager for LA Versus Hate, as well as Assistant Executive Director Robert Salles worked tirelessly to make that happen. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Chinese American Museum and Michael Truong, uh, who has been a, a key in bringing this event about, as well as Sunish Vardanyan, Rick Eng of SSG, and Rachel Schumard, uh, and Commission Senior Staff Pierre Ariola for coordinating our crew of volunteers, which you know it takes to make this happen. But I also want to acknowledge the many community partners who made this uh, happen. And you know, we really cannot win this fight without the participation of so many. So let me just quickly go through uh, the different organizations. And I won't mention the ones that we've heard from already. But we have LA Commons. Uh, and I believe President Karen Mack is here. We have Communities Actively Living, Independent and Free. The Chinese American Citizens Alliance of Los Angeles. Special Services for Groups. Uh, Rick Eng is here. Curry Town Youth Community Center. Um, Cafe Bank, who has uh, been a, a fiscal sponsor and supporter, event sponsor, OCA Greater Los Angeles, Thai CDC, Visual Communications, Artists at Play, Asian Pacific Community Fund, UCLA Asian American Study Center, El Pueblo de Los Angeles, um, the LA County Asian American Employees Association, Cause uh, USA, Asian American Education Project, Stand with Asians, uh, stand with Asian Americans, uh, Cal State uh, LA Ethnic Studies, and Seniors Fight Back. We have Hong Lee, our LA Hate Ambassador, who has led that wonderful organization. So um, I wanted to um, just say, lastly, so what? What can you do to turn back this rise in hate violence that we're seeing? First of all, number one, stand up for one another, anyone who is targeted for hate. Um, we know that when we stand up for each other, we are a better society. We do that by getting trained on what to do. There's free training available through our partner, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Um, and number two, we need to be sure to report all acts of hate, whether they're crimes or not. Uh, go to 211 or hate.org for free assistance so that we can track what's happening. We can't do anything about it unless we know. And last three, spread the word. We need it to be sure that everyone in this county knows that while you might report a crime to 911, you can report crime or hate incident to 211. We have free posters and materials, one that I showed here and earlier that are at the back at the table. Please don't leave without taking it if you're going to be able to display it in your front window, on your lawn, in your office, in your classroom, wherever it may be, or online. And I just want to um, just thank, uh, on behalf of our commission, to all of you for sticking with us. And to Ron's comment, you know, we had a candlelight vigil. We knew we had to stay until it got dark. So thank you for hanging out there with us and letting us uh, do this candlelight vigil to honor Vincent Chin's memory. Now let's welcome back to the stage 
Commissioner Gay Ewan to talk about the end of our rally and our candlelight vigil. Let's give Robin a big hand because he's been the glue that's been keeping us together and for putting this event on. So thank you so much, Robin. We've given you candles and in almost every culture, the way we send off those who are no longer with us is through smoke, whether it's incense or candles or some, uh, some people send off with bonfires. And so I want us to also have some closure in tonight's event. So if you would turn to light your candles and we set up an altar for Vincent over there and hopefully he will hear us and see us and know our determination not only to remember him, but to continue to fight on. So if you will follow those who are going, get up and move over to my right, your left, and put your candles in the container. And we will send Vincent soul, our remembrance, and thank you all. Commissioner Ewan, I, I just wanted to thank you again for your vision for us. I did want to mention that um, someone who couldn't join us today, Supervisor Hilda Solis, um, without her support, without her championing this anti-hate campaign, would, this would not be happening today. Um, she has always stood up and championed the need for our county government to protect our vulnerable from hate of violence. Um, she was there when we held our first press conference to call attention to anti-Asian hate early in the pandemic, and it was because of her that, that LA versus Hate exists today. So I want to um, acknowledge that she has provided also acknowledgments to organizations involved in organizing this event today. So um, let's please um, appreciate the leadership of LA County Supervisor Hilda Solis as well. <laughs> 